Attenzione, we are about to begin our wonderful session. Uh, my part is exploring the multiple personalities of, of Philip Zimbardo as represented in these four images. Uh, some of you may know me as professor of psychology at Stanford University where I taught for 50 years. I taught many thousands of students in a dozen different courses. Uh, and uh, I had come to Stanford in 1968 uh, having grown up in New York, which I'll t talk about in a minute. Uh, in 1971, uh, I, I conducted a study which has become one of the most famous and the most infamous study in psychology called the Stanford Prison Experiment. The experiment was a demonstration of how external situational forces can shape good people to do bad things. So uh, we're going to look at a little video uh, in a moment uh, that will give an overview, but the point of the study was what happens when you put bright, intelligent, psychologically normal and physically healthy college students in a prison, in a prison at the basement of Stanford, Univer Stanford University Psych Department. Uh, and the prisoners and guards were college kids from all over the country who were in this area finishing up summer school. Um, we randomly uh, assigned half to be guards, half to be prisoners. So at the beginning, there was no difference in college students knowing they're playing the role of prison guard or prisoner. Uh, we put them in different uniforms, of course, to emphasize the difference. And the, guard, the, the prisoners became anonymous. They became a number, and we took away their name. Uh, and the amazing thing that happened was, in 36 hours, one of the prisoners had an emotional breakdown screaming, crying, out of control. And thereafter, each day, another prisoner broke down. The study was supposed to go for two weeks. I ended it after six days because it was literally out of control. Uh, there was a, a movie just made called The Stanford Prison Experiment. It's a Hollywood movie. I was a consultant. It's at least 90% really accurate. Uh, and it's available on Netflix. I'm going to just show you the trailer of, the, of this powerful movie. So that was my acquired identity as the evil uh, Dr. Zimbardo, <coughs> uh, superintendent of the prison experiment. <coughs> my um, birthright is really as a Sicilian, <coughs> and that's what this is all about here. <coughs> my family, grew up in, my family uh, comes from Sicily, uh, and there my name is Filippo Zimbardo, uh, and all, many generations of Zimbardos came from a little town uh, in Italy near Palermo. Curiously, Sicilians are discriminated against by Italians. They're considered the blacks, they're called the blacks of Italy. Uh, some, some, uh, some Sicilians are dark because of intermarriage with Arabs early, and some, some Sicilians have blue eyes and blonde hair from the Norman invasion. So it's a very mixed culture. Uh, but the Northerners say uh, Sicilians are lazy. We don't like to work. The problem is all of the industry in Italy is in the north. So without industry, there are no jobs. So in the turn of the century, there was a huge migration of millions of Italians, uh, uh, many Sicilians, coming to the United States. Uh, the richer Italians from Genoa, who were fishermen, came here. So in fact, if you go to Fisherman's Wharf, there's Aliotta's uh, uh, fish uh, center. You can actually go fishing with Sicilian fishermen, but, but these were uh, from the north. Uh, so for me, uh, so my family moved to the South Bronx. It was always a ghetto, still is a ghetto. Uh, and I was born in 1933, so I'm 85 and a half now. Uh, and in this terrible place, this really toxic place, the saving grace were teachers. Teachers were our heroes. Uh, uh, they worked for a very low salary. Not only did they teach us, I'm talking about elementary school te teachers, I remember their names after all these years, Mrs. Ganey, Mrs. Backwood, Mrs. Mumbus, uh, uh, Mrs. Schlecht, because they had a bigger influence on my career becoming educated, becoming a PhD, than my college teachers or, or um, my graduate school teachers. Uh, and so uh, even as a kid, I began to say, there are some people in life who are willing to sacrifice for others to make the world better, a better place. And so my last identity, which is now, is in 2010, I uh, developed a, a program called the Heroic Imagination Project. And I hope you're going to visit our, uh, our desk uh, table downstairs. 
<clears throat> and the simple premise is <clears throat> we think it's possible to inspire and to train ordinary people to become everyday heroes. We started our program in high schools and colleges, and now, starting today, we are exporting our program to businesses, and hopefully many of, you, many of yours. <clears throat> and the idea is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we teach people how to become the best you you can be. Uh, and we give lessons, and so now, the lessons are, that I created are borrowed from basic social psychology, cognitive psychology, each lesson is um, about three or four hours in length with provocative videos, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, and dynamic interaction between the, the person leading the session uh, and the students or the uh, people in, in, your, in your company. Uh, and our lessons now have gone globally. We're in 12 different countries uh, all over the world. And in addition to licensing the lesson for a very modest cost, uh, you also have to provide for a trainer. So I do all the international training. Uh, Anthony, who you'll meet in a moment, does some of the local training. Uh, and the trainings present our ideas. L let me now switch to a little cute video uh, that was made for, by a student uh, in a visit recently in Hungary. I should mention in Hungary, they have a whole separate, uh, pro they have a, their program is called Hero Square and they have a division of corporate uh, heroism. And they are in 30 different companies, in Mercedes-Benz, in, my, in um, 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 Hungarian Telecom, uh, uh, many, many, many different companies. Uh, and the feedback we get, obviously we always get, is that they love our program. It reduces, uh, it builds teamwork in a company, builds cooperation reduces stress, reduces tension, and promotes a sense of well-being. So here we are. Hello, I'm Phil Zimbardo, president Louder. and founder of the Heroic Imagination Project. Louder. Our main focus is promoting the idea that heroes are ordinary people who take extraordinary action in challenging situations in their lives. Effective heroes do the right thing when other people are doing the wrong thing or more often when they're doing nothing and also to expose evil uh, in all of its many forms as a whistleblower. We believe heroism begins in the mind, begins with thinking about yourself as a hero, thinking about yourself as having an inner hero that we will help express through our lessons, our ways of rethinking the nature of good and evil. So here's one of our lessons. Transforming bystander <clears throat> apathy into heroic action. Bystander apathy is what characterizes what's known as the bystander effect. In emergency situations, the more people present, paradoxically, the less likely anyone's to help. That's called a bystander effect. It was generated many years ago by the brutal murder in New York City of the woman Kitty Genovese, where many people heard her screams and did nothing. As soon as one person helps, then in seconds, that help is expanded. Our message is, be the one. Be that person who ignores the social norm of doing nothing and creates a new social norm of doing something. So that's one lesson, <clears throat> the bystander effect. The second lesson is really critical for everybody, especially in business. <clears throat> it comes from the work of a psychology colleague of mine at Stanford, Carol Dweck, who has an amazing book you must read called Mindsets. And what, she, what, she, what we do in our program is show that most of us have a static, fixed, narrow mindset, meaning we apply it to our, it's a prejudice against yourself or others. And you say, I'm good at A, I'm bad at B. Women are good at this, but not at that. Uh, uh, Asians are bad at this, but good. So it's a kind of self-imposed bias. And what we show is that every ability Every talent is improvable with practice and effort. And you learn, there's no such thing as failure. Failure is a first attempt at learning. And so we, we build this into our program and then uh, we, we demonstrate at the end of this, people feel more proud of themselves, they're willing to take risks, uh, they're willing to challenge, and they're willing to learn from people who are successful rather than be jealous or envious. And then the third lesson that Anthony, Anthony, I'll introduce in a moment, is going to present is really reducing bias, prejudice, discrimination through understanding and acceptance of others. We call it bias reduction. 
And this is critical in hiring. <clears throat> that is, all of us have these unconscious biases. So you're, you're, you're in charge of hiring, there's somebody sitting across the table. What goes through your mind as soon as you see that person? Uh, agenda, of, of, of race, ethnicity, of disability, of age. So these are all the kinds of things that, that can't lead to an unconscious bad decision. So we help make those we help you make those decisions conscious and effective. Um, so uh, at the end of our session, uh, Anthony is now going to present. Uh, at the end of our session, we hope you'll come down to our, our table. Uh, our staff will be there, Melissa uh, Schaefer, who's program director, Adita Corona, who is on our board of directors. Uh, and we have lots of material for you. Uh, and we're also going to have a, con oh, we have a new program that uh, we just developed called the Ambassador Program. And that's, that's where we're going to involve you uh, in helping your company become more heroic. And we're also going to have a contest. Uh, we're going to give away uh, 10 of my books, signed books. Uh, and if you come to our desk, we'll tell you how, you how you can win one of the books. And now I want to introduce Anthony Black Owl, who's a, uh, a full-blooded Cheyenne Indian, uh, who is going to begin in an unusual way with a chant. And then he's going to tell you about how you can become uh, less prejudice and how you can reduce your biases. Thank you. Okay. Well, hello. My name is Anthony Blackow. I'm Southern Cheyenne Kaiwan Seneca. I was raised traditionally, so the way I come to you is in the best way. I sing a song asking you to listen to me without any blinders, to w with a wide view of life. At the about bias reduction training. The Heroic Imagination Project is transforming prejudice and discrimination and stereotyping, which stereotyping is the thing that normally sits in our ways and is um, a precedent to um, a, a social categorization. Social categorization is, is a process that precedes um, stereotyping and prejudice. So you look at it, in order to apply a stereotype or stereotype to a group or prejudice in any kind, we first need to categorize individuals into that, that, that target group. Now, when you really look at it, you would think that as we're adults and we, we have a, a cognitive ability to justify what we see and what we do and encoding that information into the way we perceive things or having that schema, a schema or a script, a script in saying that, hey, this is how I react in this ambiguous situation, whatever it might be. You're watching me walking down the street without this regalia on. You might perceive me in the state of California as Mexican, but I'm 100% Native American. So the thing is, is that we do that from prior knowledge. We start developing our ideas from the cartoons that were developed or anything that we're exposed to at a young age. So you're looking at good or evil or dark or light. What we're doing is that we're learning those things um, from a very young age. The problem is, too, that as we're doing this and as we're watching these things, we're subconsciously applying this in the way that we communicate with each other. So when you're actually also looking at it, what is powerful, what is powerless? Things that we are exposed to from the time that we're young people is having to do with that the man is strong and masculine and needs to be that hero, where the female is some damsel in distress that is unable to stand up for herself and, and able to 
to, to play the role of being that hero, of being strong. So this affects the way we communicate with each other and identify in certain roles of life. So the way I'm, the way I'm saying this is that we have heuristics, we have these schemas, we have these scripts. So the way that I'm going to apply this is this. So you're looking at this and saying, so Betsy wanted to, to bring Jacob a present. She shook the piggy bank, made no noise. Uh, she went to look for her mother. The thing is, is that when she wanted to go buy a present, you didn't have to sit there and think about, hey, I buy a present for a certain uh, occasion, let it be a birthday, let it be a holiday, or whatever it might be. She went to sh shake her piggy bank. We don't pay attention to the fact that Shaking the piggy bank might have something and it doesn't, but when it didn't have a noise, she went to her mother. Why? So you, did you ask yourself the question, did it puzzle you why, why she was interested in her piggy bank? But when she shook it, it didn't make any noise. The thing is, is that when that made no sound, we were able to correlate higher information. We are able to correlate the information that I hold money in this piggy bank. These are things that we fill in the gaps of information. So a lot of times when people are sitting in front of us and um, we're dealing with individuals, we're communicating with other individuals um, within our daily lives. When it's in that ambiguous situation, we're not knowing how to act or how to react to certain type of people or situations or groups, we're filling in blanks from prior knowledge without actually knowing it. This is called automatic thought or heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that focus on one aspect of a complex problem and you fill in the rest. This is temporary accessibility. This temporary accessibility affects the way that we deal with each other, the way that we understand each other. And that, that, that is a problem that um, Broke Imagination Project is trying to uncover and focus on and get you to re-focus on, on stereotypes as the individual benefit and that your voice is important, uh, so are others to listen to. So you have to sit there and think, when you're looking at a, a black businessman, it is faster and easier and proven neurologically that it's Easier to, I'm sorry, um, easy, easier to code the, the, the black man as black before, before a man because it's easier to do. So you're looking at a white businesswoman. The white businesswoman is easier to categorize as a woman before white. And these are the things that, where these schemas or the heuristics that I'm talking about affect the way that we're communicating with each other, affect the way that we work with each other. So this is that in-group, out-group. A lot of times the in-group, whoever I can familiarize with, is the person that I see, that I feel comfortable with. We are a social animal. So needing that group, needing to need that, uh, that, that desire to belong is very important. The only problem is that at the same time that we're doing this with the social construct is that we're placing other individuals in the out group. And we're seeing those individuals as not individuals or unique by themselves, but more homogenous to each other. So if we have these negative schemas, ne negative um, stereotypes of that group or whoever we're seeing, we apply that in the way that we're communicating with each other and the way that we're dealing. So you have to look at that. Discrimination is a slippery slope. When it comes to me, I know that this is having to do with a woman. But at the same time, when it comes to me, most people that try to deal with me look at me as being Native American. So all of a sudden, the stereotypes that have been placed on me anywhere from a childhood to the colleges to uh, other corporations that I've worked with is this, is that Native Americans are drunk, violent, uneducated and primitive. So this is the way that I'm talked to, this is the way I'm dealt with. And a lot of people don't recognize this until you're really close to me and walk around with me knowing that I'm not, that I'm not acknowledged, I'm not treated equally. I've actually been told in a college that I was in, this was by deans recently in the last two years, is that my concerns, because I, I was going through uh, uh, discrimination and racism towards me, my concerns would be addressed if I was any other ethnicity than the Native American. And I was told two years ago, as long as I keep my head down and my mouth shut, I'll be safe on there. And this is the thing is that we adopt this vocabulary, we adopt this narrative. So a lot of times when you're growing up and you learn that your, your, your whole entire group is ostracized, not seen, you have that stereotypical threat. Stereotypical threat will, will um, stop you from being that hero. That's where the Heroic Imagination Project is coming in, trying to work with other, other individuals to adopt the skills of, of the metacognitive skills. This is being able to think about why you're thinking where you are. These skills will help you identify these heuristics, these mental shortcuts that, that come from your past that can affect the way that you hire people and the hiring success that you can have for your, for your corporation. This is 
something I'm asking you to listen to because this is a real issue that I've dealt with. And I know most of the people that either are one gender or another inside of this or are gender identity with inside of this room have, have been victims to that. People that have, have the different colorations of skin are different to that as well. This is the thing that messes with me the most, and this is the reason why I've got into science. So you sit there and you look at race. Race is identified as species. We are not different species. The only thing that changes us with variations between each other is an acclimation to environment, a need to survive. We are human beings and we need to survive. We need to strive. In order to grow, we need to overcome our worst enemy, which is ourselves. And through the Heroic Imagination Project, we're training everyday heroes to take effective action in challenging situations. So I'm asking you, come stand with us and let us help you become a better you. Thank you, Anthony. It's a bit loud now. Well, wow. thank you, Anthony. That's that really good. And, and okay. Zimbardo. Um, we've got some time for a couple of questions. Then oh. we'll go to oh, the yeah. break and we're going to do our changeover. So do I have one question? So the question is, how do we get people thinking about what they're thinking and how to change that process? The personality test. Yeah, personality test. But the first thing that I would pay attention to is what we teach within this, this curriculum of bias, bias reduction training is something called LOAD, it's an acronym, and it's a level of acute discomfort. So we're able to teach that, oh, you know, a lot of people don't want to say that, hey, I have something wrong with me, hey, I have a prejudice over here, because you want that self-esteem, you want that self-accuracy. So what we're all trying to do is understand what LOAD is, and being able to identify ourselves. If you can reflect, reflect on yourself, then if you understand that it is discomfort, and that if I'm able to sit there and apply first off that I have a problem, then it's easier for you to say that you have a problem. So the forms is, is communications um, and being able to communicate with yourself. And it's, you have your personality tests, um, but at the same time, the way, the way I go is, why are you talking a certain way? Do you feel nervous? I feel nervous being up here. I have a stereotype threat because I've been taught that Native Americans were going to fail from the beginning. So I study, and I, I, I study people, and I try to understand people the best way I can. And the best way I do it, the best way I understand is that people are the worst enemies. So if you're able to sit there and say that you have faults too, it's easier for me to say that I have faults. So if you're communicating with HR or anyone else outside of, outside of yourself, you, you first identify yourself as having faults. And then it's easier for others to have that communication. And then all of a sudden now all barriers just shut down. That's the biggest barriers in the world is, is yourself. You know? So I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs>